everybody, welcome back to the Roundtable of Wraith. I am Chris, I'm joined by Roscoe in this video, and we are talking all about Vincet, the Iron Maiden, the new Shadow Runeblade hero from Dusk Till Dawn. Uh, Roscoe, you had some previous experience playing the uh, Monarch hero, Chain, the other Chain. previous Shadow Chain, Runeblade. Chain, the Fair and Balanced. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was his subtitle, right? The Fair and Balanced. Um, Vincet seems maybe more fair and balanced sure unfortunately so it's kind of funny going from a situation where uh chain is released in monarch clearly was a force to be reckoned with and l l'd very quickly um considering his power level so vincent is um it's pretty exciting the first new shadow room blade since that time a lot of people including yourself uh, maybe who were chain uh, enthusiasts have been kind of sitting on their collection and waiting for uh, another reason to uh, pull those cards out of the binder. So um, let's check up and set here and see what uh, the hero says. So it's 40 health for intellect. And it says at the start of your turn, banish a card from your hand. If you do create a rune chant token. So this is a mandatory trigger. So it's not an optional thing. You have to do it. And then it goes on to say, whenever you play a shadow non-attack action card, you may pay one health. If you do, the next rune chant effect that would deal damage this turn can't be prevented. So they have this basically built-in ability to sneak in one arcane on demand, so to speak, if you really, really want to do so. Um, and also the banishing is clearly a big part of her mechanic. I guess we should touch on the rune gate now that we're talking about banishing the card at the start of your turn. So the rune gate is a new keyword specific to Shadow Runeblade, and it says if you control rune chance equal to or greater than the card's cost, you may pay it from your banish zone without paying its cost. But you have to fulfill the full cost. You can't just have like one or two and then pay the resource left over. It's going to sit in your banish zone um, unless you have the full rune chant uh, capacity filled up. So I know that was kind of a lot to start with, but... Um, on the surface, is there anything that was kind of uh, intriguing to you about the hero and the potential of the build that you could, uh, or direction you can go with the, with the hero and the class? Well, my first impression was pretty negative because mostly this first ability is a drawback, and and I think that's still true. It's it's really <clears throat> it's really narrowing to force you to banish a card from your hand at the start of your turn. So you can still block with all four, but you can't do the really common play patterns of like blocking with three and arsenaling or blocking with three and read the runes. You're stuck always banishing a card from your hand that you're not arsenaling. I've since, you know, come around a bit and there's, there's a lot of fun things that we get to do. And we do get a rune chant as a little bit of a consolation prize, but uh, it, we don't have access to soul shackles and we don't have access to action points on like just straight up on our, our hero. Mm -hmm. So we're behind chain a couple steps for those reasons, which is fine. He was way above the pack. Sure. Uh, so she, she interacts with the banish zone in a, in a pretty different way, I think, which is fun to explore. And uh, yeah, you have to get creative. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I guess it's, you know, considering how chain operated, you're just conditioned to just being like, oh man, new Shadow Room Blade. We're going to be able to dump five cards in the Banish Zone and just spew out all the stuff like we did before. But to your point, you're only banishing one card a turn from the hero. So you don't have the potential to just go as wide as possible like you did in the other arc in, in the other hero. So yeah, there's definitely some interesting ways you can go. Maybe go tall, maybe go wide, maybe somewhere in between. Um, but that's, uh, that's the beauty of having a new hero here to try to figure out what the best, uh, approach is for the deck. Yeah. And the, and the way to evaluate the cards that get played from banished is totally different. If Vincent is your main way to banish them because she still costs you the card. And the thing that so many of the shadow cards, particularly the older ones that chain used they're the way they get over curve is by not costing you a card which Chain could do easily because he was banishing tons of cards out of his deck just normally via Soul Shackle. Um, in this case, when you're banishing the card from your hand, it's still costing you itself. So a lot of Monarch's Shadow cards are just bad in that setting. Like, they're not at curve. They're under curve. And they have the fact that you can play from a banish as their upside. 
which is really good if you're getting card advantage somehow. But if Vin is your only plan to banish, then what you want is cards that get overcurve by being banished alone, even if they still cost a card from your hand, if that makes sense. And we don't have a lot of those from Monarch. It's mostly about Runegate. Yeah. In my estimation. For sure. And Runegate, they've certainly juiced her with um, a decent density of these Runegate cards, um, which we'll get into in a little bit. But um, it seems like that could be one of the primary ways to kind of exploit her ability. And like you said, um, take the or make the most out of this one card single banish uh, each turn. So with kind of that context on the table, they have given us a new weapon, which is called the Flail of Agony. And it's a Vincette specialization, so specific to her only. Uh, it's a one-handed weapon, so you can also hold two of them if you want. You can hold the Lantern in the other hand for some Arcane Barrier if you want. Um, but it says, once per turn action, pay one health attack. When this hits, create a Rune Chant token. So this is the first weapon that I can... Th- I mean, there is no other weapon where you're pinging yourself any health to attack that I could... As an alternate... Um, a- yeah, activation pay- cost basically paying life as a cost is new yes so it's not in the rules yet that, technically <laughs> <laughs> so on the surface one life for a one damage and possibly a rune chant doesn't i mean it, it doesn't really seem that exciting and if you do this i mean you know five times you're starting at 35 health let's just put it that way so um what was your first impression here of the flail yeah my my opinion of this card is still quite low. Um, I'm, I'm ready to be wrong, and the art is really cool, but I really hate a weapon that hurts me. That's, um, uh, like, when I'm thinking about weapons, I'm thinking about the end game when my deck is small and my hands are more awkward and I'm trying to close out those last few points of damage. It's when my weapon choice starts to, like, really, really count. And if I have a weapon that's killing me to even use i just hate the feeling of that so um totally possible that that cost curves work out in such a way that having this free attack accessible to you in the mid game is like really good and i like how cheeky and annoying it is but uh i do not love paying life for a weapon that is not what i really want to be doing yeah no doubt um it's just an interesting weapon like you said it's just it seems until you kind of maybe try it or really, really try to lean into it in your build. Um, it's hard to evaluate, but um, we uh, the other day we were kind of talking and brewing up some ideas. But you and I are kind of keen on uh, the Nebula Blade maybe being the preferred choice um, for Vincent because it has that same clause of uh, ending your turn with a Rune Chant, but it's just more damage, and you're not killing yourself at the, or pinging yourself at the same time. So. Um, our other option is uh, Rosetta Thorn, but we were kind of talking too about how Rosetta is kind of like a Nambo with Vincent because you'd like to end your turn with the Rune Chant going into your next turn cycle. And obviously the Rosetta Thorn is consuming any Rune Chants you have on the board, um, you know, at the end of, at end of your combat chain there. So um, you're, you're thinking Nebula Blade 2 for the moment? Yeah, I like, I like Nebula Blade. It's a lot fairer than Rosetta Thorn. Um, definitely could be that Rosetta Thorn ends up just being better because of how good that card is in the Mm -hmm. first place but I'm definitely going to be starting with Nebula Blade because on the one hand if I'm doing Rosetta Thorn uh, Viz can possibly do most of those lines just better and then yeah you hit the nail on the head she really really likes the if this hits make a rune chant as her last attack because going into a turn with one rune chant already sitting there makes your access to rune gate a lot easier if we're really leaning into that. Yeah. Yeah. You and I had talked a good point about the viscera thing where yesterday we were kind of just brewing up some ideas and going through the cards and it's like, well, if we're, if we're going to lean into Rosetta Thorn, we would just probably play viscera instead. It's just like, a, if we're trying to do that in Vincent, it's just not going to work as well as the traditional stuff we've already seen, you know, for the past uh, couple seasons with, uh, you know, viscera exploiting the, uh, mm-hmm. the Rosetta. So, yeah, with her caring about Rune Chance so much, she shares a lot in common with Viserai, at least a lot more than Chain ever did, I think, uh, which leaves us in an interesting space where a lot of a lot of deck ideas that I start coming up with for her just turn into bad Viserai, 
and then Biz can do it better. Like for a while, I was thinking about her first ability, and like, wow, I get to print a free rune chant every turn. Maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the power of this card. And then I remember that Vizerai does that multiple times a turn, and <laughs> always has been. Right. Like arguably much easier. So yeah, if that's if the reason you're playing Vincent is to make a rune chant every turn, then just play Viz, and mm-hmm. you'll do better. Sure. Um, but yeah, that that uh, another interesting conundrum that kind of leads us into now talking about the cards. So, Nebula Blade, Flail of Agony, Rosetta Thorn, Viscerai, all of these things kind of um, all these factors definitely influence how we look at these cards now going forward through the pool. So, I think yes. we're going to um, maybe skip the Grimoire, and we'll kind of come back to that a little bit later. But let's just kind of get into some of these Rune Gate cards. I think it's kind of a good place to start. So we'll come back to the Majestics in just a second. But at the rare slot and the common slot, they have put in, let's see, Deathly Delight, Deathly Whale, Rift Skitter, Vantum Banshee, and Vantum Wraith. So there's one, two, three, four, Five of these rune gate cards at the rare and common level that are the cycles of the red, white, and the blues. So um, we were talking about how the two costed rune rune gate cards are certainly much easier to achieve starting with two. As we talked about previously with the weapon, maybe you can end your turn hitting with the nebula blade or the flail rune chance sitting there beginning of your turn, banish the card. Boom. You were automatically online right away. So the, the curve or the, you know, the ability to be able to play a three can be incrementally just exponentially di- more difficult to achieve on the surface without, you know, really leaning into that um, that situation. But in your estimation, do you think that the difference from the twos and threes is pr- pretty significant or maybe might kind of um, be a little hyper- hyperbolic there with um, the difference between the two costs? Well, Obviously, something that's going to be hard to say until we try this out with this new mechanic. But yeah, you're absolutely right that getting two is a lot much easier than getting three. Like, uh, there's a lot. So, uh, Vin will print one just naturally. And there's a lot of ways to create exactly one rune chant. Your weapon is one, reduced to rune chant is one. Um, the Envelop in Darkness, which is a really important card we'll talk about, mm-hmm. is another. So it's it's pretty... It's not too hard to print one more rune chant. And to get to your threes, you need to get two of those things to line up. Which, again, is not impossible, but greatly narrows the number of hands that that's going to happen in. Yeah, definitely, no doubt. So with that on the table, let's kind of just go through these here. The Deathly Delight is a two-cost rune gate. Uh, Five power for the red. And then this one says, when the combat chain closes, gain health equal to the number of heroes who have lost health this turn. So possibly you're gaining two health in an ideal world, one from your opponent and one from yourself. So it's actually kind of like a pseudo seven power attack in a way, if you're kind of getting two extra points of value on the back. Um, But this is one that we had put in our list initially. Um, What do you think about this effect in general of the uh, the gaining the, the health? Yeah, it'll it, it refunds you for doing Viz, Vin's uh, second ability, which um, you need to do in the first place. We need some shadow non-attack action to precede this card. We often want that. Probably going to be Envelop in Darkness a, a lot of the time. Um, so it's it's weird because we're not we, we spend a life to most likely gain two. So it's a net of one. So I would call it more like six, but it does guarantee you know it makes that unblockable rune chant free so if we have other things that anything else in the turn that wants us to have dealt arcane damage be that like a meet and greet or uh creepers even keeping that online Mm -hmm. it really leans into all that stuff for sure yeah and now that you mentioned the envelop i just think that we should maybe talk about that just right now because (laughs) because i think it gives a lot of context into kind of how we're evaluating these cards because when we yeah, were, I think it's a cool, huge deal. Yeah, when we were talking about it, we started with the three reds, and then by the end of our little conversation, we were at the full nine in the deck. So um, it seems like this is probably just the most important enabler that you mentioned. Like, you get the free rune chant from Banishing, 
here's a nimbleism and a rune chant cost reduction all at the same time in one card so this is a, a cycle red yellow blue one cost shadow rune blade action to block it says create a rune chant and the next action attack action card you rune gate this turn gets plus three power for the yellow or the, i'm sorry plus three for the red plus two for the yellow and plus one for the blue and we are happy to play any of these at any time so you know we were talking about how kind of the way that we've been thinking about the deck is if you um you know you banish your rune gate card and then you have a blue and you also have a mavrian skies that's like the you know what we're trying to aim for on our on a big power turn where you mavrian skies you envelop in darkness and then you're playing the rune gate card from your banish zone and with the go again you're also coming on the back with the nebula blade if you have a blue uh pitch for the envelop in darkness so um yeah it's it's yeah. kind of funny how this card just went up and up solid and up four cards right there yeah yeah so um anything about this one you want to touch on before uh we kind of keep going with the rune gate cards um it, yeah it's kind of bread and butter yeah you you said everything it does require a really high density of rune gate cards for it to actually be mm -hmm. live very often but that's the game plan that it's really leaning into so i think that a great majority of vincent decks are going to really lean into rune gate which makes me then think that a wide majority of vincent decks are going to love envelop in darkness sure yeah i think yesterday we were talking like our final count was like we had what like 27 rune gate or something or 24 or something like that just yeah. in 60 cards we were just kind of throwing something together but yeah this is a, a key piece of the of the puzzle that's for sure so kind of with that context in mind we're going back to uh the rune gate deathly whale this is a three coster uh, six power for the red and this one says when the combat chain closes create rune chant tokens equal to the number of heroes who have lost health this turn so this seems like a really good on hit effect for uh, what we're trying to do and carry stuff over um if, even if you don't have a go again you're still leaving mm -hmm. stuff behind potentially so this one seems pretty good yeah this one's pretty awesome as a chain ender as the end of your turn or as your one tall attack for the turn um this gets you two potentially three for the next turn to set off your next rune gate um yeah I, I really like this one i'm happy with maybe reds and blues yeah i don't remember what we were slotting in same, but same we definitely had the reds um, that's for sure and this it's even fine to play it like hard cast this can buy you a two cost rune gate after it if you get your action point somewhere sure um yeah it's it's good stuff for sure yeah i was just saying this Using is crazy ability. looking I don't even know what's going on here with this mouth here. It's just, oh my goodness. It's wailing. So, yeah, he, <laughs> no kidding. Um, all right, so that's a five for the yellow and a four for the blue. And this is also something, it's, it's just a six for, you know, illusionist matchups. Um, so um, giving you a little hedge there. Uh, the next one is Rift Skitter. This one I think we are not as high on. This was a three coster, and this is simply Rune Gate Go again. Uh, four power, uh, three for the yellow, two for the blue. Um not really any exciting on hit effects like the other ones have or just a high power just to go again but um what do you think about this guy the, the yeah. skitter well it's pretty normal for a rune gate card that in that it's above curve if we rune gate it and it's like far below curve if we don't being three cost means it's kind of hard to rune gate at least as far as we know what, what one of my biggest vincent question marks that i I'm not going to know until I play some games is like how much we want multiple action points in a turn. And so when we were theory crafting last, we were valuing that pretty highly and putting in a lot of cards that buy action points that exchange a card for an action point. Um, and in a world where we want those, we probably are happy with this card because it, it collapses that into one card. So it's very efficient. Um, so it's fine for sure. But I think Vin might also be really happy with just single attacks a lot of turns when she's mm -hmm. not going crazy and in those kind of shells i don't like this one as much um yeah the way we yeah. were the way we were kind of just initially going about it was more of the tall with pop possibly a nebula blade on the back so you know this didn't exactly fit into that scheme or shell but um it's definitely um a cool piece to have in the card pool for a different type of um synergy and, and archetype you know yeah. Um, we have a variety 
in how we can get action points. Like once we decide how often we want additional action points, Vincent has a lot of ways to get them. There's rattle bones. There's the cards that just buy them, like Mothrin Skies. You mm-hmm. got this guy. So a lot of decks should be able to flex their action point access into ways that make sense for them. Sure, which is gonna be fun. No doubt. All right, next the Vantam Banshee, which was the June uh, Armory promo. It looked pretty sweet. So this is a big seven uh, seven attack, just a three cost Rune Gate. So seven for the red, six for the yellow and uh five for the blues so i think we had the reds and and blues in just because this is a nice you know above curve blue quote unquote for free a five um a fiver for free if that's the one you're you're choosing to use in the Mm -hmm. gate situation but uh nothing too exciting other than it's just a big hitter so um you know you have the enveloping darkness plus this i mean that's a 10 power attack so it's pretty good yeah yeah rune gating this is bread and butter goodness um so i love i love having the red for the high point for high just ceiling and it's also an interesting thought that on most of these cards if you successfully rune gate them with cards that are let's assume are efficient on their own then the blues are actually still above curve way above curve for being blues so you said this one if we're actually not spending any resources on it we're just spending itself as a card it's a zero cost for five power which is above curve you know that's better than red Wounding blue, for example, mm-hmm. still blocking three and pitching blue. So I, I obviously I want to have red rune gates because I want to be spicy and and get like reach to make up for the fact that I have to do all these weird things in my life. But I'm also <laughs> really happy with a lot of these blue rune gates because even if that's what I'm buying, um, it still can be okay. Yeah, definitely. They're solid blues, surprisingly so. Yeah, and. Also, like you mentioned, all of these rune gate cards are uh, three blockers, so that certainly helps the cause nice. as a as a blue, you know, mm-hmm. pitch three, block three, so that doesn't hurt either. Um, all right, so that is oh, I sorry, got one more. This is a good one. Uh, this is the two coster, the Vantum Wraith, and this is just a six power two coster. So, one. like we've been talking about the entire time here so far, two costers are very much more reliable than the three as far as like you know not having to sacrifice just not blocking for a turn um but uh, i think we had um same with the with uh to the banshee in our deck we had slotted the reds and probably the blues. six yeah yeah yeah, yeah this uh, card's pretty sweet i think yeah. most all the two cost rune gates at least at the start for me are going to make it in just because mm-hmm. that's kind of easy to do our bread and butter things and then once we play more we'll figure out how much more fancy we can reasonably get and how how much how much more greedy we can do and more three or four spoiler cost uh rune gates <laughs> there is a four in here that's true so we'll see if that's uh something we can get to um all right let's go we're gonna go back up here to the m we'll talk about the four right now because why not this is the so there's a there's a series of these widespread blank so widespread annihilation is the blue one widespread destruction is the yellow one and widespread ruin is the red one. And these are three separate majestic rune gate cards that all have some sort of different on hit clause um, attached to them. So widespread annihilation, blue pitch, three block, four coster though. So you gotta have four rune chance if you're gonna try to rune gate it. And that's a lot. And it's a six power and it says when the combat chain closes, each hero who has lost health this turn banishes a card from their hand. So this is a really, really powerful on hit effect, you know, pseudo pummel type effect, but they're banishing the card. Um, I guess with that in mind, potentially maybe not as good in like a mirror situation um, if they can take advantage of the banish zone. But um, against any other class, it seems very, very, very good. And it's a six power for any sort of illusionist uh, situation. But yeah, until we see the ease of getting the, um, you know, the four power for free or the four resources or rune chance for free, uh, but you always do have the option of just hard casting it from your hand. So, um, what do you in your est- I mean, the way we built the deck, do you th- th- to get to four? We're going to have to really try to work to that. You think, or I guess we just need to play and find out. <laughs> but yeah, I really like wide widespread annihilation. I think it's one of the reasons you play Vin is probably to play three of this mm-hmm. card. So I think every Vin deck wants to figure out how to make it happen. I'm guessing. Um, the uh 
this uh, lost life clause, you know, it feels like an on hit, but it's pretty relevant that it's not an on hit. It doesn't require us to actually hit with it. We're going to be able to buy this mm. for free, most or not for free. We're going to be able to buy it and guarantee it a lot of the times. So this is this is a pretty gnarly card to swing at somebody because they don't they don't ha- really care about blocking it, but you're still sending six power and taking a card from their hand no matter what. Um, That's a good point. I didn't really think about that. Yeah. And and yeah, so if you're if you're starting with Vin kind of along the lines that we were where we're kind of have a couple sources that drip one rune chant per turn either on the opponent's turn or on our turn then getting th- getting three cost rune gates is possible you just need two variables to line up getting two cost rune gates is pretty easy getting a four cost i think you need like a specific plan so you need to put things into the deck that are like this is the way that i get to widespread annihilation um so a uh, huge one that rune blades know and love is revel and rune blood. If you can turn it on by playing another attack and a non-attack, revel just buys you widespread annihilation straight up. Yeah, I think that will be really common. Yeah, or figuring out how to get uh, read the runes in here as an instant or with an eloquence. Mm-hmm. You know, we're gonna you're gonna put things in your deck that are like these are cards that enable my widespread annihilation plays. Sure, and probably be playing to that a lot. For sure. Yeah, Revel I'm going to start anyway. Revel is certainly on the surface just the the easiest one, I guess, for lack of a better term. Obviously, it just gives you the four runies for itself. So, you know, if we line up a Mob Skies and then play an attack and then, you know, have it in the banish zone. So maybe this is one that, like, if you are in a situation yeah. where you. Action point and attack, Revel and widespread. Yeah. Is solid. If, if that attack is zero cost, then that's a four card hand, which is great. Right. Like, a, um, the one that's really good, like swarming gloom fail, mm-hmm. classic viscerite stuff going on. Sure. We love that hand. That's for sure. Bonkers. Yeah. That's really good. But maybe this is like a card though, where if you, um, get it in the banish zone, like maybe this is something where you're going to like have to like sit on it for a few turns and maybe take a few points of blood debt, um, to try to set it up. Um, but certainly the payoff is definitely there because you're kind of, you know, obviously your opponent being down a card is never good for their um, offensive output um, mm. on the crackback. Yeah. The pulling cards out of their hand is like one of the strongest things you can do in the game. It's yeah, amazing. No doubt. We so don't get to choose the card, but that's true. But it's still a card. So um, the next one you, is you mentioned a really important thing that I think we should oh, sure. call out. Go ahead. There's there's this there's a little region of Vin theory crafting that we haven't really ventured into yet because I have no idea how to do it. But it is totally possible to banish cards and not play them on the turn they get banished. Um, sometimes you might have to do that and feel bad about it. But it definitely could be that Vin's game plan for big turns is to be setting up certain things in the banish zone. It becomes, it, it might be helpful to think of it as sort of like an arsenal that hurts you, mm-hmm. that you can stack multiple cards into. Um, yeah, I haven't really gotten too nerdy with this idea yet, but maybe that's where harder to cast things like widespread annihilation might live. You banish it one turn and just play with your other three or four cards, and then it's your next turn that you're actually buying it. Right. So those are possible lines. Those cost you life, so they have to be really spicy to be worth it, unless it? you're just backed into a bad situation. Sure. But this is a pretty good agreed ingredient. And... Um... If we're going to go full ceiling here, there is also a spicy card that we were th- talking about, which is a uh, blue pummel in uh, in yeah. this deck. So <laughs> if the stars align, you can also pummel um, the widespread annihilation. I mean, that's insane. That's pretty good. Yeah, we like the thought of pummel with Vincent because we're going to be playing tons of cards that it can hit. Mm-hmm. So it's just going to kind of be live all the time. Every rune gate card you, yeah, is live for pummel, yeah. And if you get yourself... These ones are kind of weird because they don't have actual on hits it's it's the best if pummel can also buy you an on hit that they tried to block anyway that's true um so it's it's really good if you're sending out a shadow puppetry or a mavrian skies that's like giving your rune gate card a on hit that they try to cover mm-hmm. and then you pummel on top of that that's just salt in the wound yeah, for sure goodness <laughs> and the reason that we're or one of the reasons we got to pummel was because before we talked about that line of playing the envelop in darkness for one resource pitching a blue and having two floating and sending the free rune gate cards. So we're like, well, 
we can either possibly attack with Nebula Blade on the back of that, or maybe there's a situation where we don't have a go again, but maybe we have a pummel. So it's kind of like you have just a little bit more play there with those two resources um, from the Enveloping Darkness uh, starter. Yeah, love a pummel. Love it. All right, so we go to the widespread destruction. This is a three coster. This is the yellow. Uh, six power again, and it says, when the combat chain closes, each hero who has lost health this turn banishes a card from their arsenal. So a little arsenal interaction there, maybe for the rangers or such. Um, mm -hmm. I don't... Th so initially we did... This is the only yellow, I think, that we had top of my head that was in there. I can't recall exactly. Or maybe we didn't. I don't know, but... Um, what do you think about I know just we were the, waffling it. Yeah, right. I think yeah. I've grown on this card since that conversation, though. Yeah. Looking at other cards that we are choosing to play, like if I if I want Phantom Banshee, mm -hmm. just as a three cost seven, I I really like this as a three cost six with a pretty powerful upside For and sure. being a yellow in the meantime. No doubt. Especially you have to make in, uh, sure you're not sitting on an arsenal. Right. Which is should be pretty easy to do. Right. Um. Yeah, especially in a in a world of of Lexis and Rangers, having some arsenal interaction is never a bad thing. So, yeah, which it's possible to make it un, it's possible to make it fully uninteractable. If you have a shadow, non attacking there, then Vin can just buy this, get your rune chant guaranteed, get an arsenal destruction guaranteed. There's not a lot of cards that do that, like even Command and Conquer, you can block. Right. Um, so it's pretty, pretty powerful. That's true. I definitely. I, I'm liking it a lot more, yeah. especially as a yellow. It's pretty, pretty good. We just came around on it in about 15 seconds right there. We're in on it. I like it. <laughs> All in. Uh, last is the red one, which is the Ruin. And this is a six power, again, red two coster. And this one says, when the combat chain closes, each hero who has lost health this turn banishes the top card of their deck. Maybe this is the one where we were like, eh, this one's just like not as... Uh, relevant i guess or as impactful of a of a clause compared to the other two i think maybe that's what it was but i yeah, guess definitely it's lost life clause is less detrimental to the opponent um i keep flirting with the idea of building vin greedier who wants to actually banish cards out of your own deck more often and it really leans into that well mm -hmm. but i think it's absolutely playable as long as the two cost phantom whatever right. is like just being a two cost room gate alone is good enough. Is yeah. good enough. Yeah. Um, to just do our kind of normal three or four card hand game plan. Mm -hmm. So it, it it's it's on rate even if you're buying it with resources. It's just fine. Sure. At worst. Yeah. Um, and to your point, we've also like you said, we've also been toying with or even throwing out the idea of aggressively trying to like you know chain yourself so to speak and really try to self mill yourself and there's a lot of cards that aren't in our current deck that could play into that strategy and you know this one clearly self milling yourself or self banishing yourself um could be very powerful with a high synergy mm -hmm. style deck so all right that is the widespread trilogy there the ruin the destruction and the annihilation um we have three more majestics here and these are all actions or instant speed cards uh, the first one is Funeral Moon. This is a zero cost Shadow of Runeblade action three block, which is nice. You may planish, you may plan, you may play this from your banished zone. If a hero has lost health this turn, you may play this as though it were an instant. And all it says is make a rune chant with blood debt. So one card for one rune chant that you can play from banished zone, possibly at instant speed yeah this one i do not quite understand yet so i don't like it it's it it strikes me as the kind of thing that is not balanced around costing itself as a card so it's a thing that you want if you're banishing your own deck more often um like chained it right like tossing a card tossing a card for a rune chant even if it doesn't cost an action point is not amazing and not really what we want to be doing i'm much happier doing an envelop in darkness even though it costs a resource because it's also getting me power in the meantime um, yeah it's like in, even in the way that we built the deck with such a high density of rune gate cards like if you have this in your hand and you also have a rune gate card there's zero chance you're going to banish this card over the rune gate card 
right? So like, right. what is it even doing in, in this particular style of, of Vincent, you know? But, um, it seems like it's like a Mordred Tide Hungry type card. Maybe. I don't Could know. Maybe that makes it better for sure. You know, but without it having go again, like you know, Eloquence token or, oh, I guess it has instant speed, but, um, yeah, it's just kind of an, an awkward card, but we were not high on it for our initial sketch of the deck. Yeah. I still, I still want to keep an open mind and kind of trust that this card makes sense somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it has three black. Playable from Banish is a pretty powerful sentence. I think I suspect that it will exist at some point. Yeah. yeah. But um, currently I'm not in love. It's that so unexplored archetype. Unexplored archetype that we haven't delved into yet where this thing's going to fit. For I sure. think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next we have Requiem for the Dam. This is a uh, zero cost Shadow Room Blade action. Just like before, you may play it from the Banish Zone. Just like before, if a hero has lost health this turn, you may play it at instant speed and make an eloquence token. Uh, so here's a little action point um, injection into uh, the archetype. And just to clarify the eloquence token, we'll go down here and pull that up real quick. Um, this is the new quicken for non-attack action card. So it says, when you play a non-attack action card, destroy the token and the card gains go again. Um, so the other way to make an eloquence token so far is the grimoire of the haunt, just on demand, destroying the, the book uh to make an eloquence token but so far this is the only other way that we've seen just a hard boom make one mm -hmm. so this one seems like it could have some some upside though but uh you know again it didn't really fit into our initial scheme so what do you think about the about this card yeah um it's in a similar space where i don't really think i understand it yet um we are pretty i think we're happy to play cards that buy action points so in a vacuum, the thing that this card does makes sense. Uh, but it wants pretty specific things, because Eloquence synergizes with non-attack action cards that don't already have Go Again, which are ones that we're used to kind of avoiding for that reason. So it's doesn't, you know, it doesn't make things happen by itself. It's something that you makes read the runes better. Mm -hmm. um, let so maybe if your plan is to much more often like go read the runes into buying a whole rune gate, this is certainly an enabler for that plan. Um, even, but even the other cards that we do play, I, I don't like them only because they buy action points. Like spending a whole card to buy an action point is not amazing. Yeah. But the Mavrin Skies gives us a gnarly on hit that threatens a rune gate on the back. Like that's cool. I like that for sure. Shadow puppetry is giving us access to our second ability and also maybe banishing, and giving us card advantage. So they usually do more than give us an action point. Right. And this one at best gives us an action point at a time that we could, it feels to us like we can build the deck without needing an action point off of non attacks. Right. So mainly again, because mainly because of Mavrian skies, though, I mean, it just gives you the go again. So it's like we don't need the eloquence token in the way that we're playing the deck. Kind of like you said, yeah, if we're so. doing if we're doing attack, attack or, you know, non attack, attack, attack mm -hmm. or non attack, attack weapon. Then there's no place for an eloquence token there. Unless we start really going more into things like read the runes and right. I guess other non attack actions that don't have go again that I'm not thinking of because yeah. I usually ignore those exactly so. yeah yeah the There's one that sleepers out there the one that we were initially looking at yesterday was the blessing of a cult which is that aura that sticks on the board and then pops to make three on your next turn but does not have go again so like there's probably more of those types of instances out in the pool that we didn't look at but that's got to be the like you know a central place for this sort of card to exist in that sort of shell you know yeah and we we were thinking about that for a while because it seemed to make a lot of sense with rune gate and then i i, I thought that card had go again honestly <laughs> and then uh, when i realized it didn't we were like oh uh just read the runes does the same thing for us right it's gonna be better yeah most of the time. for one less resource yeah all right uh so time will be time um We'll tell about Requiem for the Damned or Funeral Moon, at least for our type of style. The last Majestic here is a Vincent specialization called Oblivion. Uh, this is a instant speed card, a uh, blue pitch, and it says play only if you control exactly six rune chants. And if you do this, you're summoning Nazareth, the Soul Harrower token. So should we go down and check out the Soul Harrower token? Where is this at here? 
Of so, course. There it is. No, that's Nazar. Yeah, the Soul Harbor. Here we go. Okay, so it's a uh, six health shadow token ally so it comes on the board once per turn action zero cost attack with it for six power and it says when nazareth hits a hero banish a card from their soul if a light card is banished this way gain one health so obviously has some play into any light hero situation uh, as far as trying to uh you know uh negate their soul potential there but outside of the light matchup do you think that this card warrants a slot in the deck yeah, definitely. It's kind of sad that it isn't a little spicier, although if I remember correctly, maybe the other demons are the same way. And it's really just about getting a 6-6 six, six stat stick out there, Yeah, which lets you start playing a little differently. You don't have to play towards the Nebula Blade as much. You can just end with your ally, swing for 6, yeah. and no resources. Let's your big hands get bigger and your small hands do more. Um, I like this card. I think we definitely want it. I'm a little sad that then doesn't get a special attack, like a specialization attack like Chain and Leviah both did. Um, but at least she gets her demon summoner, so this sure. is nice. I think um, it's it, it's possible, certainly possible, to pull this off. Having exactly six for enchants is not impossible by any stretch, especially if you're already putting in the kind of cards that buy you widespread annihilation sometimes. Mm-hmm. That same like family of cards can eventually stumble you into six rune chance yeah um it's by the way really helpful to note that this being an instant if you have more than six rune chance they all trigger individually so you can just stick this right in after your seventh rune chant gets sent when you have exactly six and you can summon the thing right so um basically you just need to get more than six rune chance and then play this at exactly the right time and you'll turn it on so if you can somehow create boatloads of rune chance, maybe you know putting putting Mordred Tide makes this way more likely. Could be a thing you end up wanting. Um, but I like it. Yeah, especially since it's only taking up one slot. Certainly, for sure. I'm I'm gonna play it for a while until I really feel like taking it out. Right. Yeah. I mean, definitely gotta start and try. Right. And we have currently read the runes, um, revel in rune blood. So those two cards alone will get you there, um, combined together. But um, yeah, we I don't mean to be a broken record, but we've been talking kind of ad nauseum about it's just going to take us playing the deck to figure out like how many rune chants are, are we able to make consistently? Do we need more? Do we need less? Do we need um, less attacks, more more rune gate, less rune gate, whatever? So I'm um, just like anything. It's just it's cool to get something on, on paper, but until you really get in there in the trenches, it's kind of hard to know exactly um you know the potential of what you're trying to do and how easy yeah and there are these weird there are these like really trippy edges to vincet's design space that i'm excited to look into so right right now we're in a kind of viserai adjacent thing like i'm assuming that we're blocking with one ish cards and trying to attack every turn and present present pressure which is good fundamentals but vincet also has access to these weird things that we've mentioned like maybe we're banish arsenaling for multiple turns setting up particular combos or maybe we're playing the dimensional gateways and the shadow puppetries and the widespread ruins to try to banish our own deck mm-hmm. and get chain style card advantage and start playing those older shadow cards that you know become good if they don't actually cost us cards and maybe we greed in that way um so those are so experimental that <laughs> We can't really say anything about them, but they sound cool. For sure. I would, to- I would totally agree. All right. Um, there's just a couple more cards left down here. Um, there's this card called Putrid Stirrings, and this is a Shadow Rune Blade action. There's a cycle, red, yellow, blue. It's a common three block, and uh, it says you may play it from the Banish Zone. Your next attack action card you Rune Gate this turn gets plus five power. Go again. Blood Debt. So it's a big slogism. You can play from the Banish Zone, but it only will buff a Rune Gate card. Um, so this one we were not also super high on, just based on the cost of the card, and it doesn't give you a Rune Chant to help enable your Rune Gate card. But plus five is certainly a lot, and being able to be played from the Banish Zone is, um, you know, if you're trying to, you know, maybe go into that self milling plan is certainly something to keep in mind as well. But um, any thoughts yeah, on this I think- one? Yeah, greedier Vincets might want this. 
because it's it's like an old style shadow card. It's ban it's good if it doesn't cost itself as a card. Turning a blue into plus five go again is great. Turning two cards into plus five go again is much less great. So there. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. Yeah, and the yellow is uh plus four, blue is uh uh plus three. Um all right. Looking down here. Oh, there were two shadow cards that we wanted to touch on um, that we think maybe have a little bit of legs and different types of uh, potential Vincent builds that we've been alluding to. Uh, the first one is called Beseech the Demigon, and this is a shadow action, zero cost, and it says choose an attack action card in your banish zone. It gets plus three power until end of turn, go again. So nimbleism that has to target a card um, in your banish zone. Um, strictly better than nimbleism in, uh, when you're trying to mill yourself, obviously, cause you're going to have density of stuff of targets, um, in there to hit. So this is, yeah, this is, we realized as we built our deck that we had very few cards that actually triggered Vincent's second ability, which may be fine. I'm sure some Vin lists are going to do that, but we started looking for, Hey, what are, what are some shadow non attacks that feel good? And this one, it blocks two, which is lame, but yeah. that's the shadow. That's the talented card life, I guess. Sure. Um, it is probably bread and butter, the kind of thing that we want to do. It's not as amazing as Envelop and Darkness because it doesn't help us rune gate in the same way. But uh, depending on how often we want to be able to buy that unblockable rune chant, uh, this is definitely not bad. Like three power go again is fine card. Yeah. Um. Pretty cool art style here. Kind of not, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's kind of like grainy, I guess, you know, a little bit. Yeah. If that makes sense. Cool artwork. Yeah. Uh, next one is Tear Through the Portal. Zero cost shadow action. Choose a red action card in your banish zone. Gives it go again until end of turn. So, again, similar premise to what we just talked about, but, uh, you know, turning on Vincent's uh, ability, and if you have a high density of stuff in the banish zone, you have a likelihood of this... Uh, finding a target so pretty yeah good. i don't i don't like this card and i don't really want to play it i would i would mu like i was saying earlier i would much rather play things that also give an on hit mm -hmm. on top of just buying an action point but uh in some future where you really really want to trigger vincent's ability a lot then this is a fine way to do that if you like the shadow talent so much that you want it more than stuff like Mauverns guys sure um lastly down here we have just the rune blade section so there is a viscerai specialization that isn't really relevant to this discussion and there's also a card called runic reckoning which is a one cost rune blade action uh three block and it says this car this costs one resource less to play for each rune chant you control so the classic uh you know, a rune flash uh, arc knight ascendancy discount and it says the next rune blade attack action card you play this turn gets plus three power so basically just a free nimbleism for rune blade uh that's a three block yeah we in a vacuum we like this card we like that cost less per rune chant text because that's stuff that we're already doing so we're probably looking at those viscerite cards anyway including this one um it's it, it it doesn't feel as good as um envelop because it's not shadow and it doesn't lean into rune gate per se, but it's just fine. Spending a card for three power, having played a non-attack action is useful for a lot of yeah. various things. Yeah. But kind of feels like more of a Viscerai card on the surface to me, but, um, you know, Viscerai likes it a lot more yeah. because he just wants to play non-attack actions and yeah. rune blade cards. He doesn't care about right. a shadow talent at all. Right. He's not shadow. He's just a rune blade, at least not yet. Yeah, for extremely edgy one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's, there's also these, uh, so the carapace, which is the legendary arcane barrier two, temper two, pretty good option. Um, we were going through the equipment pool and we we're like, man, this actually really helps against wizard because <laughs> now you get just a B four out the gate basically against them, which is really yeah, good. without even sacrificing any important pieces of gear. <laughs> yeah. So this is a really cool card. I know there's been some, uh, it's been a pretty polarizing card on social media as far as people like, oh, this is a boring legendary, whatever, but um, it's as, I know you've used this term today, but bread and butter, I mean, this is it <laughs> right here. So, and I guess they were saying that there's no, there's no, I've, I could be misspeaking here, but there's no other chess piece. That's like AB two or something. It's like the only one 
I think, or I, I chest piece. That's yeah, possible. Yeah, I can't recall. Brute has name. it on their head at least. Sure, because they're so ramming their pieces with it. Because they're ramming their head against the wall all the time. Yeah, so I don't know why. They need extra protection. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, do you want to talk about the Scepter of Pain? We didn't look at this card. This is um, this is a cool uh, wand where yep. you're just chucking arcane damage as a rune blade. So once per turn action, two resources, deal one arcane damage to any opposing target, Aether Ashwing perhaps, uh, create a rune chant token for each damage dealt this way. So it seems pretty narrow, but it's, it's a cool effect. I don't know. Yeah, I like this as a consideration. Um, it's, it's something that's definitely great if you want the other hand for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, like a arcane lantern or if i'm really undervaluing eloquence and we really want the grimmery you could bring this um it's cute your opponent is probably going to be happy to arcane bury you anyway right i would think maybe half the time at least so feels not amazing in those situations i'm happier with with nebula blade just threatening more damage overall and yeah. being like and- roughly equally annoying to block and being a break point yeah this is less conditional though sure. um and has really cute interactions with with allies so right maybe maybe just bring this into dunk on dragons a little <laughs> bit more than you would otherwise yeah could be just a metagame sideboard call but uh to your point about the grimoire let's go up there and look at that real quick uh we skip this th- so we come back to it at the end new offhand uh shadow room blade specific instant speed pay one resource banish the grimoire and make an eloquence token uh ab1 um we were playing um i can't recall now what gloves did we have in the deck we put in because it wasn't grasp the the quill hand oh yeah quill hand hand. yeah to, to make oh that's a good we forgot to mention that the quill hand is a great way to get to widespread annihilation when yep. you need when you yep. need to so. buys you something once per game yeah yeah because grasp of the arcanite is actually re- pretty bad with vin because mm-hmm. we're going to start with one rune chant a lot of turns so a lot of the times that you would be triggering it i mean it still blocks three so it's really good right. but right it's actual ability proactively is not that good because it's usually going to cost us an entire blue to do so the a lot of the hands when viserai is going to be triggering that are like impossible or just extra bad for Vin to do. So we really like, unironically, the uh, Vexing Quill Hand to, you know, once per turn kind of bail us straight into whatever rune gate we have online. Yeah, definitely. Or it's a way to climb up to those high ceilings of six or four at just the right time. Oh, uh, yeah, the Grimoire is certainly interesting, though, and it'll be, um, you know, an, uh, an eloquence on demand is certainly uh, could be a pretty powerful thing in the right in the right situation. Uh but again, requires you to use a one-handed weapon. So, what's the give and take there? Um, so, Vincent the Iron Maiden. Uh, I think for right now, um, if you've been watching this the whole time, I know we've been kind of alluding to this deck that we kind of were brewing up. At least for the moment, we're probably gonna be leaving that um, off the channel until we kind of get a chance to try it and uh, maybe make a few tweaks to it or adjustments. But hopefully, in the future, we'll maybe we'll bring you a little deck tech video kind of explaining this initial premise but um anything to close on roscoe before we get out of here uh clearly she's v tier <laughs> v tier wow what a way to end it everybody knows love it love it well if you've been with us for the last 53 minutes we really appreciate you guys watching um we still have um some shadow brute cards to talk about we still have some light illusionist cards to talk about and there's a specialization for how many of the heroes down there bravo briar old him uh i don't know who's down dorinthia so such a weird set like <laughs> all these classes get all this stuff and then there's just one spec for like these light heroes who are fighting against the the shadow but Boo. Boo. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for watching. If you have any uh, Vincent ideas or concepts you've been messing with or playing with, please let us know in the comments. But uh, on behalf of Roscoe, this is Chris. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.